Now I'm going to hide the controls. Oh, bother. I need to hide them from the video camera, too. It's, it's gone. You know, watching your professor fumble with the electronics during lecture is a sport that never gets old. <laughs> Guaranteed. Okay, so um, that doesn't look very good up there because I tried to use a burnt orange background, but it says unit one, defining sustainability. Okay, um, there are some recommended reading if you are interested in more information. None of this is required, but I'm going to pull a lot of information from these three sources um, over the uh, course of this unit. Um, so the first one that we'll talk about that kind of sets the stage for what energy is and what sustainable energy is and why we need more of it um, is a book by Dr. King on, uh, it's called The Economic Superorganism, but it's about growth in general. Um, second one by McKay, this is a classic text in the sustainable energy community. It's called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. Um, it's available for free online. It's got a lot of good stuff and exercises and activities and that sort of thing. Um, and then there's a book from the group at MIT, uh, which is more about, it's a little more technical. Um, it has fewer pictures, um, but um, it's also a, a good one. Okay, so with that out of the way, so the uh, first part here, we'll see how much of this we get through today. It's called Energy is Good. And so I wanna show you why energy is good. So here's a little bit of a lengthy quote from King's book, and I'll give you a second to digest that and read it, and then I'll kind of give you my the TLDR version. That stands for too long, didn't read for those of you. Okay, so the point here is that if we go back to the 18th century, everything went at a much slower pace and the uh, population was lower and generally the standards of living were lower than they are today. Um, nowadays, everything moves faster. Travel is faster, uh, financial transactions are faster. Um, the earth is able to sustain a larger population. We're up northwards of 8 billion people right now. And so, you know, if everything's been going well, basically since the start of the Industrial Revolution, uh, wealth has been increasing, people's lifespans have been increasing, shouldn't we just keep doing what we're doing, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we'll get to that last point in a minute. But what I want to focus on is the first part of that, which is that energy is good, okay? And that's one of the fundamental things that we're going to remember in this class. Um, it, as I'll show you, it drives gains in people's quality of life as measured by GDP and life expectancy. And it, um, what was the other part of that thought? Well, it, it, it makes for uh, you know, improvements in people's quality of life and has done so over the past at least millennia. Okay, so here's a really cool graph um, from King's book. And this is, let's see, on the y-axis, this is the uh, expenditure on energy by type of fuel as a percentage of gross domestic product. And down here in the fine print, I have the um, definition of gross domestic product, but it's basically um, the amount of money that's in the economy at a given time. And um, we're looking at the United Kingdom or before 1707, it's just restricted to England, but um, <clears throat> going back to the year 1300. So this is a very rich database. And what you'll notice is that back here in the 14th century, um, almost 100% of GDP was simply expended on fuel. And what's really interesting is that you look at the portion of that that is simply food that is used for physical labor um, by people, okay? Fodder down here, that is for feeding your horses and your oxen and all the other stuff that's that's on your farm. But, you know, significant fractions just, you know, buying the food that you need so you can, you know, operate a hand plow to plow your land, okay? That's pretty incredible. Um, when you look here, starting... You know, about around the mid the mid 18th century here, 
is that we, all of a sudden we see a bunch of new sources of energy come on the scene, namely coal, petroleum, and natural gas, okay, fossil fuels. And along with that, we see a marked reduction in the fraction of GDP that is being spent on few on energy. Okay. So here at the beginning of the 21st century, we're down to around 10% of GDP um, from a high of close to 100% uh, 700 years ago. So that's pretty cool. Now, I mentioned that date in the middle of the 1700s. 1769 is when James Watt pat patented the steam engine. And this is widely viewed as the start of the Industrial Revolution, at least in the United Kingdom, because now, rather than humans and animals being the source of energy and physical labor to get stuff done, now we had steam engines that could actually do things more efficiently and cheaper. Um, and along with that, you needed fuel to power the boilers that provided the steam for the steam engines. And initially, most of that came from coal. But over the years, as we added oil and, and gas to the mix, those become became um, uh, kind of more, more dominant. OK, so the point, the takeaway point from this slide here is that um, the Industrial Revolution coincided with a reduction in physical labor and uh, physical labor in favor of power from fossil fuels and an overall decrease in expenditures on energy. Now, OK, you could quibble a little bit with this last point because it might be more interesting just to plot inflation adjusted costs associated with fuel, because obviously the GDP of the United Kingdom grew over this period as well. But suffice it to say, if you're going from spending 100% of your GDP on fuel to about 10%, that's probably a good thing. Okay, um, this is a slightly different graph, but it really tells the same story. Um, it's, uh, let's see, the y-axis here is energy expenditure for uh, fuel for services, okay? So this isn't just like food to keep you alive. This is fuel actually um, to get stuff done, which is slightly different from what I had on the previous thing. Again, you can see a lot of human labor was used prior to the Industrial Revolution. There's our 1769 um, right there. And um, again, you can see um, here, you know, heat, transport, lighting, those are the dominant um, uh, services that require energy uh, now in the UK. Now, when you look on this side of the Atlantic, you see a similar story. Obviously, in the United States, our historic record doesn't go back as far, but here's data going back into about the mid-1920s, and um, it's a slightly different um, y-axis from what we had before, but um, this is as a percentage of GDP looking at different expenditures. So um, food plus energy has come down significantly. Um, and, uh, you know, if we were able to expand, expand this y-axis, you would see that the uh, relative cost of energy has come down as well. Okay, so the point here is that both in the United States and the United Kingdom, um, we're spending much less on food and energy than we were even 100 years ago. And so this is overall um, a good thing. Question here. Okay, so this is, it says here, intermediate purchases by the food and natural resource sectors. So this would be like <clears throat> fuel for logging trucks or food for animals that are then sold for meat, that sort of thing. So they're kind of built into the, the other costs. Okay, great. All right, let's look at another metric. So we looked at spending for food and energy as a function of uh, GDP. Now let's look at a different metric. This is average life expectancy. So what I'm plotting here, these are data from 2013, and it's as a function of energy use, and energy use has been converted to the very useful unit of kilograms of oil per capita, because we all know we're out there, you know, chugging a kilogram of oil. You know, I just had one for lunch before I came down here. 
All right. Um, these data go back to 2013 because that's the most recent data I can find. Um, <clears throat> I've inflicted a little bit of editorializing on this graph by plotting the x-axis on a logarithmic scale. You always got to watch out for that sort of thing. But I was good. I was a good boy. I kept the y-axis uh, linear. Okay. You can see that there's a little bit of a trend. Generally, there are no countries that are down in this bottom corner where they're consuming a lot of energy, but they have low life expectancy. Um, there are no countries up here in the top left corner either, which would be where they're not consuming very much energy, but they have high life expectancy. Um, and the idea here is that um, larger energy consumption has something of a correlation with longer life expectancy. And if I point out a couple of specific countries that are on here, I think this illustrates the point. Um, uh, Iceland has uh, one of the highest life expectancies. They also have uh, relatively high energy use. Part of that is due to the fact that they're in a relatively cold part of the world, um, but they do have that high life expectancy. The United States is down here, still in that grouping of higher life expectancy and higher energy use. Down at the other end of the spectrum, we have um, South Sudan and Mozambique, which are some of the poorest countries um, in the world and have correspondingly low life expectancies. Um, let's look at another figure here. Okay, this is um, the same plot, but now uh, I've still got the 2013 data in red dots but I've added data from 1959 in yellow squares. And one thing that you notice is, let me draw an arbitrary line here at a thousand kilograms of oil um, equivalent per capita uh, per, per year, okay? If you look to the right of that, those countries have generally seen an increase in life expectancy between 1959 and 2013. Um, if you look to the left, there's been not nearly as much, if any, increase in life expectancy. Um, you might be tempted to say, oh, actually, they've lost life expectancy. I think that's mainly due to sampling bias. Um, the 1959 data set is heavily skewed towards countries in Europe and Eastern Asia. And this is a lot of the global South, which I think explains why you see that scatter. Okay, so again, since 1959, more energy consumption has been associated with increases in life expectancy. Here's another plot. I promise you, I'm almost done with the plots. Um, this is energy use uh, plotted versus Gross domestic, gross domestic product in 2010 US dollars. Um, this one's a little interesting as well. You can see that in both data sets, the 2013 and the 1959, there is um, a fairly well-defined relationship, okay, with the caveat that we're looking at a log-log scale now, okay. But when you plot it in log-log space, you can see that there's a little bit of a relationship. If I just fit lines to those using least squares regression, what you see, interestingly, is that um, the countries that have used more energy since 1959 have seen generally seen increases in GDP, whereas the countries at the lower end of the spectrum actually have seen reductions in GDP. Okay. Now, I don't necessarily know if this thing at the lower end of the spectrum is real or not because, again, of the, of the sampling bias. But the point here, again, is that just like with life expectancy, um, higher energy usage has, is correlated with an increase in GDP between 1959 and 2013. Okay. Now, I will also add um, that we're making the assumption here that life expectancy and GDP are accurate proxies for quality of life, which, you know, I don't know, you could argue, you could make arguments, but um, anyway, I think that that's generally, you know, that's, that's generally what people do. So we're looking at, um, that's what we're looking at. Okay, so um, 
higher energy consumption, better quality of life. Now, let's have a look at energy consumption by source uh, going back to 1800. Um, you've all heard of that. How many of you have heard of the term energy transition? Hopefully all or most of you. Okay, we'll get to what that is in a minute. Okay, but one thing you'll notice is that over time, since 1800, the world has generally added more and more energy sources to the mix of what's being used, okay? So in the year 1800, this is worldwide, so not restricted just to Northwestern Europe. By looking at the world as a whole, upwards of 95% of uh, energy was still produced by biomass. So that's basically burning wood, um, that sort of thing. Um, Coal largely re, um, replaced much of biomass by 1900. And then since 1900, we've seen oil take up some of that and then natural gas. And then we've got, let's see, uh, hydroelectric, nuclear, and then other renewables, which right now are a very, very small drop in the bucket, but they are increasing um, as we go forward in time. But um, suffice it to say, and this is an important point that we'll come back to, right now, generally the way that we produce energy is by burning stuff, okay? Whether it be burning coal, uh, burning gasoline in your car to make it go, burning natural gas like they do across the street at the uh, power plant, you're generally combusting stuff to produce heat that is then used to do other stuff, okay? Um, and the other point that I want to make here is that for the most part, with the exception of coal displacing biomass, since 1900, additional energy sources have not supplanted other energy sources. So you can see here that you know oil took a little bit away from coal, but coal is still a substantial fraction today. We're just adding more and more energy sources to the mix and they're not taking each other's place. And does anybody have an idea of why that might be? Yeah. Demand is increasing. Yes, exactly. Um, so as the population grows and countries get wealthier, the demand for energy goes up. And so the world, as population continues to grow, will have a continually growing demand for energy, okay? So the points here, we're getting to the end of the energy is good portion here, is that we see that energy consumption is positively correlated with quality of life as measured by life expectancy and GDP. And growth in the use of fossil fuels specifically has been correlated with less need for physical labor and a reduction in energy cost. Um, since the beginning of the 20th century, we have seen more and more sources of energy being added to the mix uh, while maintaining um, the, all the other ones that have come before. And that is mainly due to the fact that energy demand continues to grow. Okay, so this gets us to the end of that first point, going back to the quote I showed at the beginning, which is that um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Let's just keep producing more energy and everybody's quality of life will continue to improve. Okay, so... We'll take a pause there while I switch out to our next unit. Any questions about that? Yeah, right here, Tom. So, yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, um, have I or anybody else looked at any actual metrics for happiness, uh, which, you know, there's some publications that, that cover that sort of thing, and its relation to energy use. And um, the short answer is no, I haven't looked at that. But but that's an interesting question. Um, you know, if I can, you know, I can pick on one country here. So um, Scandinavian countries routinely uh, fall within the top category in metrics in terms of happiness. And for sure, we see Iceland out here, um, I mean, because what's not to like about living on a, a geologic hotspot eating pickled fish all the time? <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. Um, I don't recall specifically, but I know a lot of the other Scandinavian countries are 
in this range here. But I think rather than looking at kind of these broad brush generalizations, it'd be really interesting to get into the granularity of you know how energy consumption uh, not just is correlated with happiness, but what the causative component of that, if any, is. Um, and I think that's an interesting kind of sociological aspect of the energy transition um, that, you know, it's funny, we're, we're engineers and we typically don't, well, we often don't think about those sort of things, but we should because being a good engineer means that you are making a contribution to society using your engineering judgment. And part of contributing to society is understanding the social aspects um, of what you do. We'll get into that a little bit um, in this class, um, but that would be an interesting thing to look into. That would be a great topic for an individual presentation if you can find any studies. On it. Other questions? Okay, fantastic. Now let me just pull up my other um, slide here. Okay. Okay, so this next unit is called problems with energy. So we just said energy is good, but the key point here is that the ways in which we currently produce energy uh, need to be improved. And I'll tell you why. But first, we're gonna talk about glaciers. Why are we talking about glaciers, Dr. Day? I promise you that there's a reason, not just because they're cool. Okay, so glaciers and glacial ice start out as snow, okay? What happens is that the snow falls at the surface and the snow is made up of mostly snowflakes. As that snow gets buried over time, it gets compressed. And when you get down to a depth of somewhere between 60 and 110 meters, the air pockets that are between those crystals and the ice get trapped. And so if you can measure the properties of the air in those trapped bubbles in the ice, you can get some understanding of the composition of the Earth's atmosphere at the time when that ice was between 60 and 110 meters below the surface, okay? So you don't know exactly what year you're looking at, but you know pretty close, okay? Um, this is your um, vocabulary word for today, which is FIRN, F-I-R-N, and that is the term, term for the open porous um, component of the ice when it's closer to the surface. Unfortunately, we don't have a cool word uh, for the ice once it gets below that. I guess we just call it ice, which is fine. Okay, a lot of what we know about past atmospheric composition and past climate comes from very detailed studies of ice cores, um, both from Greenland and Antarctica. So here's what a typical ice coring operation looks like. It's basically like taking a rock core, except what you get is ice, and you get something that looks something like that. So Greenland, uh, the drilling on the Greenland ice sheet has taken us back about 110,000 years, so almost to the beginning of the last glacial cycle. Um, Antarctica goes back 750,000 years, so we have a pretty detailed record going back pretty far. So what they do with these ice cores is that um, they cut them and they send them to the lab, and then they melt them to release the bubbles. So this is a nice microscope image of trapped air bubbles inside ice. There's your uh, scale bar there, um, two, two millimeters. And then they run them through, you know, um, gas chromatograph or whatever, um, ICP, to, uh, to measure the, the composition, not just the composition of the gas, but also the isotopic fractionation, which is very important. And if you don't know what isotopic fractionation is, that's fine. We'll get to it in a minute. Okay. So first of all, about atmospheric composition. If we, you might say, okay, well, how well, you know, how accurately does this actually portray the composition of the atmosphere back then? Well, uh, here's a nice comparison of 
ice core data from La Dome, which is a spot in Antarctica where they like to take ice cores, um, and uh, actual measurements of the atmospheric composition at the um, South Pole. And you can see that there is very good agreement over the years where both data sets overlap. Now, you'll note that there is a little bit of scatter in the ice core data. Again, that is because of those uncertainties on exactly what date the ice bubbles come from. But um, to the extent that we can accept that there's a little bit of uncertainty on that, uh, the agreement uh, is quite good. So what have we learned from ice cores? We've earned, learned. What have we learned? From, I haven't earned a single thing from an ice core, but what we've learned is that over the past 800,000 years, there have been cycles in atmospheric carbon dioxide composition. So what we've got here on the y-axis, this is CO2 parts per million. And you can see that starting right here around, this is what we call the, um, I'm going to get this wrong, but well, ne never mind. Around here, about 500,000 years ago, you can really see these pronounced cycles of peaks and troughs. These correspond to glacial cycles. So when CO2 is at its highest, this corresponds to a warmer interval. We call that an interglacial. So we are in an interglacial right now. The last ice age ended about 18,000 years ago, and we're in an interglacial. The lows in, uh, in atmospheric CO2, those correspond to the peak, the maximum glaciation during that ice age. And going back about uh, one and a half million years to something we call the mid-Pleistocene transition, the ice ages, at least in, in both the Northern and Southern hemisphere, have followed a pretty um, consistent 120,000 year cycle. Okay, now I'm gonna add one thing to this graph. So you can see that generally uh, we are between 300 parts per million and about 160 parts per million of CO2 concentration. Boom. Uh, 2020, the average all of a sudden was above 400 parts per million. And I think right now I checked last week, uh, we're at about 423 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere on average. So one thing we know from the ice cores is that atmospheric CO2 right now is higher than it's ever been over the past 800,000 years. Okay, now that's just, that's simply an observation that we get from measuring the composition of the air bubbles in the ice cores. Now I'm gonna show this with a slightly different stretch on the x-axis, and we can look at a couple of things over the past 10,000 years or so that might be interesting. Okay, so now we've got kind of a weird backwards logarithmic time scale here. This was a really um, cool graph that I found on a Reddit forum, which, you know, I'm really doing high quality research here. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, so yeah, there's like a bunch of interglacial, glacial interglacial cycles. Um, the last ice age started about 120,000 years ago and it ended around 18,000 years ago. And since then, CO2 levels started ramping back up because that's what we expect them to do. Um, and then what's really interesting is that they remain high. There's the Roman Empire. Um, let's look at the Industrial Revolution. Okay, what happens after the Industrial Revolution is that all of a sudden the CO2 levels really ramp up. And that's where they start going above anything we've seen over the past 800,000 years. Um, I don't know why they needed to put the invention of dynamite on there, how that's correlated with uh, CO2 levels, but I guess maybe when you combust, no, never mind. Let's not, let's not get into that. Um, they're kind of snarkily calling out Bitcoin here. <laughs> anyway, so the point here is that this rapid rise in CO2 levels over um, the past you know, 260 years um, is somehow correlated with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, now, all right, you'll say, well, okay, let's make another correlation. This is, you know, we can estimate um, the contribution to atmospheric CO2 purely from combustion of fossil fuels. And um, you'll see here that there's something of a correlation. So we've got different y-axis here, obviously, um, but you can see that 
a lot of the increase can be attributed to uh, combustion of fossil fuels. But this is correlation, not causation. So how do we um, ascertain whether there is a causative effect between fossil fuel combustion and CO2 concentrations? Question. So that's a, that's a good question. And the answer is yes. They arrived at the CO2 emissions from fossil fuels based on, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but it's looking at the isotopic fractionation of the carbon, um, the carbon isotopes in the in the CO2. Follow-up question. Yeah. Yeah, so the um, the isotopic fractionation of um, organic matter, so basically anything that could be burned and release CO2 is uh, generally very well constrained for the, the carbon isotopes. Now, for the oxygen isotopes, um, there's a lot more variability in terms of temperature and the type of organism and that sort of thing. Um, but we know what the fractionation of carbon isotopes should be for any carbon that's derived from burning something that was biological, well, whether it's wood or plants or coal or, or other fossil fuels. Okay, um, so there's a lot of text on this slide, but this is basically saying what I just said uh, in response to that question. We track, you know, so the emissions track, um, um, and we know that atmospheric CO2 is never this high so, you know, before the Industrial Revolution. Um, the, there's another point here, which is that if you look at atmospheric circulation models, um, we know that there are no known natural sources of CO2 that would be out of balance with the sink in the atmosphere to such a degree. Now, when I talk about natural sources of CO2. These include things like volcanoes and uh, different reactions from naturally decaying organic matter and that sort of thing. So it's inconsistent with any of those natural sinks um, that we know of. Um, and lastly, the big thing that we look for is the isotopic fingerprint of the carbon in the CO2 that uh, is consistent with what you would have from uh, combusted organic matter. Okay, so for isotopes, uh, this goes back to your chemistry class. So carbon mainly has three naturally occurring isotopes. There are actually 15 of them, but most of what we see uh, is either carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Uh, carbon-14 is a radioisotope, and it has a half-life of about 5,700 years, so it's good for dating like archaeological stuff. Okay, I think it works back to a maximum age of about 50,000 years. Um, so it's good for that stuff. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about carbon-12 and carbon-13, okay? Carbon-12 is about 99%, and carbon-13 is about 1% of the carbon that we naturally see. However, there are processes that make those portions vary slightly, and those are important. One example of such a process is photosynthesis. So here's a you know, um, horrifically simplified chemical reaction for photosynthesis, but you're basically combining CO2 with water, and then that's catalyzed through the photosynthetic reactions um, to give us sugar and oxygen, okay? And that's what plants use to provide fuel and also to provide the various chemicals they need to build themselves. So, you know, carbohydrates and that sort of thing. Um, the thing here is that Carbon-12 weighs less than carbon-13. Um, and so it takes less energy to react carbon-12 with something than it is to react carbon-13. Um, nature is lazy. This is always the case. And so the whenever you have this photosynthesis reaction, the products of it will be enriched in carbon-12 relative to the initial source of the CO2. And we call that process fractionation. So this is isotopic fractionation. Now we quantify this by using um, a number called del delta carbon delta 13C. Okay. And 
you simply measure the uh, carbon 13 to carbon 12 ratio in your sample and then compare it to a standard. And then we express this actually in per mil. It's uh, multiplied by a thousand. Um, and the standard that we generally use is a type of rock called Vienna PD belemnite, which is a fossiliferous rock that the international community has agreed is going to be the worldwide reference for carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio. So that's what we do. Okay, so because plants are going to have less carbon-12 relative to 13 than our standard, okay, this means that the delta-13C of plants is going to be less than zero. And in fact, um, there's been a bunch of geochemical, or I wouldn't say geochemical, but biochemical modeling on this topic. And it shows that for most of the photosynthetic pathways that are known, you're always going to end up with a delta 13C between minus 10 and minus 30 per mil. Okay. Now we call this depleted because it means that the sample has been depleted in carbon 13 um, from the source. Uh, if we had a positive delta 13C, that means it's, uh, it's enriched. But right now we're looking at a depleted source. So you look for isotopically depleted carbon atoms in your CO2 in that 10 to 30 per mil range that give you an indication. Okay. And so the reason that we know that this, how much of this atmospheric CO2 comes from burning fossil fuels, it's because fossil fuels start off as plants. It's mostly algae, but some other terrestrial plants get caught up in this. And so when you burn those that material, whether it's the plants or the fossil fuels, you'll make CO2 that is depleted in carbon-13. Um, the other thing that you look for is what the carbon-14 fraction is in that CO2. And if you're burning something that is very old, say millions of years old, all of the carbon-14 would have decayed away and it's not gonna be present. So that's the other thing you look for. What is the isotopic fractionation, carbon 12 to carbon 13? And then you also look at what is the carbon 14 component? And you look for minus 10 to minus 30 per mil delta 13C and an absence of carbon 14. And that is how you can tell it came from burning something, burning something very old. Okay, if you went out and chopped down a tree, don't please don't chop down a tree out here. But if you did and you burned it in your fireplace, that would produce CO2 that would be depleted in carbon-13, but it would be enriched in carbon-14 because those trees are young. So that's how you can tell. Okay, um, this is a good stopping point. Um, any questions before we leave? No. All right. Well, thank you all for coming here, and um, I'll see you Wednesday, and I'll give you an example of uh, an individual presentation.